Amen. Well, the rest of us can turn over to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And uh, for the last few weeks, we've been reading in John chapter 5 where Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, a man who had been sick for 38 years. This man had placed all his hope in a superstition of the day surrounding the waters in this pool that occasionally would would be stirred. And the belief of the day was is that these waters were being stirred by an angel. And the first one that could get down into the pool, whatever ailment they had would be cured. And so that was uh, what this man believed. The Bible says that there were a multitude of sick people located in this pool. But in an act that demonstrates our Lord's sovereignty, Jesus chose to heal this particular person. It is conjecture, you know, that this was all a superstition. Uh, because I told you the last couple of weeks, the latter part of verse 3 and all of verse 4 do not appear in the early manuscripts. So it's believed that a scribe added this for clarity based on the beliefs of the day. And today we look back and say, well, this was probably a superstition because the Jews were a very superstitious people. When I think about the multitude of people laying around this pool looking for healing, but their hopes were based in a superstition, I think about the millions of people searching for spiritual healing in modern day superstitions in the form of false doctrines. Yesterday we uh, drove up to Jacksonville to see Tristan before he goes back to school next week. And so up and back we're listening to sermons on uh, YouTube and listen to one in particular about uh, good preachers that have gone bad. And um, just some of the things that they were sharing. Uh, is alarming. People that, uh, matter of fact, uh, this guy, as he's rattling off these names, he rattled off one of, one of my heroes. And I went, whoa, wait a minute. What, what, what did he do? And so now I'm going to have to go back and do a little research. And of course, I haven't listened to him in quite a few years, but I used to listen to him every day. But there's a lot of false doctrines in the world today. And I think it goes beyond the fact that there's uh, men and women who are willing to, uh, to perpetuate uh, these uh, false doctrines. It's more of a spirit. And as we know, the Bible tells us we're dealing with principalities, okay? So there's this evil spirit in the world today uh, where men and women, they want, to, they want to satisfy the flesh. They want what they want. Uh, they look at the Bible and they may even read the Bible and they well, I ain't doing that. It's too hard. Uh, or that's inconvenient. Uh, I'd rather be able to do what I'd like to do. And so uh, this uh, emergent church that we're seeing uh, infiltrate the world today is that's what they do. They have a God that uh, is catering to the, the, the being, uh, the created one, rather than the creation honoring the creator. And um, it just uh, seems to be uh, prevalent in our society today. Now... It's just speculation on my part, but I think that the reason Jesus chose this man <clears throat> for healing is that he had been ill for so long uh, that maybe he had lost all hope of ever being healed. This man had placed his hope in this pool and the stirring of the waters. And Jesus come along and asked him, wilt thou be healed? Well, of course I want to be healed. I've been sick for 38 years. Look, I've only been sick for a year, and yes, I want to be healed. I was uh, reading yesterday and uh, on Facebook or something, somebody was getting ready to uh, go through something similar, and I thought, wow, man, you, you got a road ahead of you, but, you know, with the Lord's help, you'll be all right. Jesus wasn't offering a superstitious cure. Jesus was offering a total healing. When Jesus lays his hand upon you, let me tell you what, you will be a new creature. The Bible says that old things become new. I lay in bed sometimes and I might be thinking about a particular person or whatever and I'm just asking the Lord, so Lord, I don't know how you can do it. I just know you can do it. I know that this person's life is a mess. I just said, I don't know, uh, you know, in my world, uh, in emergency management, we do everything by checklists. There's a step one and there's a step two, there's a step three and uh-oh, 
if we need a step 3.5 that throws us off and we have to blink for a minute and we have to think and then sometimes we have to think outside of the box, all right? But that's just, that's just the way that we, we process things. Jesus, whenever he heals, he brings complete healing. He can change a person's heart, his, his being, his attitude, that the things of the world that they have such a taste and a craving for will suddenly uh, disappear. As I said to you last week, the healing of this man created such a stir amongst the Jews. Why? Number one, because he healed him on the Sabbath. And according to the Mishnah or all these oral traditions of the Jews, they had, I think it was something like 38 categories of how you honor the Sabbath, something like that, to where they said, no, what are you doing carrying your bed around? You can't be doing that. Who told you you could do that? And, of course, the man didn't even know. He didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus had, had uh, gone away immediately after his healing. He's going to see him later in the temple, but said, I don't know. And then Jesus, in, in, as he began to talk, he said, my father. And as soon as he said, my father, they began to, oh, blasphemy. So their belief in false doctrines generated this great hatred towards Jesus Christ. They were being good Jews. They were being Jews who were defending their faith. They were being Jews that, uh, after uh, following after what they had been taught from the very first uh, day of, of, of school, uh, of course, I don't think they had Sunday school back then, but um, from their training, from the prophets of old, they were, they were living and doing the things that they believed were to be good Jews and honoring God as they opposed Jesus and his teaching. As I said, this man didn't know who healed him. He didn't know Jesus. And he didn't know who it was that said to rise, take up thy bed and walk. It's a disturbing account to me to read of these religious leaders overlooking the healing power of Jesus. And all they can focus on is that their offense. You've broken one of our traditions. Many years ago, we used to have a, uh, we used to have a Bible up here on a little cradle that held it and and I had moved it. we were doing something and uh, Sister Cindy had made this uh, church and uh, we were doing some kind of fundraiser and I had moved the Bible and put that up there and matter of fact now I'm got kind of worried I don't know where that Bible's at uh, but I had someone in the church walk up to me and say well where's that Bible I said well it's back here in the back and well, that's been up there for years, you know. You just don't take that Bible down. You know, it's got to be up there. That's where it belongs. And, and so they were all upset because I had violated their tradition. And so, you know, uh, as we say, you know, there's, there's white elephants everywhere you go. And so one of the things that I learned very early in ministry was that you have to separate the things that are tradition from the things that are scriptural. Because uh, being raised in, in a Christian home, being raised... My, both my sets of my grandparents were believers in Jesus Christ, and uh, my, uh, both my grandparents, both my grandmothers especially, were staunch uh, believers in Jesus Christ. But there were some traditions along the way. And so you don't want to, uh, you don't want to get caught up in the traditions of man and, 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 and get upset when those things aren't honored and what have you. Because you know what? You may, you may celebrate Christmas different in your home than we do in our home. Um, my mamma Miller, as long as I can remember, you know, we would gather around the Christmas tree and, and we would read the Christmas story and we would have a time of prayer and then we'd worry about what was under the tree. Uh, and that's how I grew up. Uh, other people, they may, not, they may not observe it in the same way. To me, that would be like blasphemy. You're not going to take time to honor God? You're not going to take time to read the Christmas story? I mean, I'd be like, ooh, I'd be total, I would be uncomfortable. So don't invite me over to your house Christmas Eve if you're not going to read the Christmas story. You're just going to make me uncomfortable. So, like I said, the man didn't know uh, who had healed him. But these Jews, they're all upset because he broke the uh, Sabbath, and uh, they began to build this, this bitterness and this hatred for Jesus to the point that they began to contemplate to put him to death. This is the problem with false beliefs. Later, Jesus found the man in the temple, and he told him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So was Jesus talking about a, a worse thing physically? 
Yeah, he probably was. He could be for certainly. But I will tell you this. So I'll tell you that he was telling for sure that if you don't follow me, if you don't uh, obey my commandments, if you uh, disobey, then hell waits. Hell awaits. So there can be a worse state of being than what you're in or were in or earlier. While Jesus could heal the physical body, it was the soul of man that he came into the world to heal. In the latter part of chapter 5, Jesus begins to explain how he can offer spiritual life for those who are spiritually dead. While the Jews were beside themselves because Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath and referred to God as his father, these men began to uh, contemplate how they were going to put uh, Jesus to death. Even while they began to contemplate the murder of Jesus, he is sharing with them the message of salvation. And I think that's a, that's a message for you and I today. That when our friends, our family, our co-workers, our neighbors, if they begin to persecute us, if they begin to mock us, if they begin to belittle us for our faith in Jesus Christ, our response to them is to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. I know in the flesh sometimes somebody calls you a name, you want to bow up and you want to get in their face and you want to defend yourself and you want to do this, you want to do that. But that's not what... A uh, believer in Jesus Christ is that's what a not a follower of Christ because uh, as a Christian we're saying we want to be Christ-like and as we read about the life of Christ we time and time again we read when he's persecuted even when he's nailed to the cross uh, even when those that would spit on him and would slap him and what would he do he did not respond in like manner he shared forgiveness he shared grace he shared love and that's the example for you and I Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Because the hour is coming when all men will have to give an account of their lives before Jesus, you and I have to be committed to telling others about Jesus Christ today. Today. This morning, I want to preach a message entitled, The Hour is Coming. The Hour is Coming. Would you stand with me as we read a few verses here this morning, please? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Let us pray. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, and I thank you for the first resurrection. The first resurrection where the believers will come and and they will receive their reward and the reward of eternity in heaven. And Lord, I ask that if there be one here uh, this morning that is facing the second resurrection, the resurrection of the damned, that this would be the day and the hour that they would choose to avoid that, that they would choose to love you and to honor you in all things in their life. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So in the 24th verse, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So let's remember who Jesus is speaking to. He's talking to those Jews who have accused him of blasphemy for calling himself God's son and for violating the Sabbath according to their traditions. Again, when he says, Verily, verily, what he is saying is truly, truly, It is the strongest language of the day that Jesus can use to say to them, I want you to listen to me now because I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. All right? It's not my truth. It's not not, uh, uh, John's truth. It's truth in the world of reality. These things that I'm saying to you. There are uh, only one way, one way, to God the Father, and that's through God the Son, all right? This, uh, this pluralistic 
uh, message that's going forth today where all paths lead, lead to, to God is, uh, well, I, I will tell you it's a lie in what they're, what they're trying to say. Uh, I think uh, it's true in the sense that, yeah, we're all going to stand before God, but not all of us are going to be welcomed in. And that's what I think that is the horror of the message that goes on today. More and more what we're seeing from the pulpits in our country today is this uh, uh, universalism where they're saying that, oh, well, Christians and Muslims and Hindu and, and Jews, and uh, we're all going to go to heaven. That's a lie. We're not all going to go to heaven. The God of the Muslims is not the God of Christians. I want you to be clear about that. All right? Because what's the Bible say if you deny Christ? then it's a false doctrine. It's heresy. They will tell you that, yeah, they believe in Jesus, but not, not as the Son of God. And look at what's going on in the Catholic Church with this Pope that's sitting now. He's saying to the homosexuals and to the atheists, yeah, yeah, there's a place in heaven for you. You just do the best you can, and you'll be welcomed into God's heaven. Folks, that's not what the Bible teaches you know, but uh, in Catholicism, they seem to be this all-encompassing and, and anything that comes up. And you go back and look at the history and how uh, the Catholicism got started. They just, they just kind of take it whatever culturally arises and they just embrace it and they, and they uh, bring it within into the fold. And why? So they can have the power and the influence and the money that goes along with this. The homosexual community, a lot of money. There's a lot of money in that community. And so, yes, they want homosexuals to be Catholics or to uh, attend Catholic churches and, and, and give money to the Catholic Church. That's the problem with these false doctrines. They cater to the individual. They don't teach the individual to bring honor and glory to God. He goes on in verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Job asked the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? Well, the Bible makes the answer very clear. Yes, yes, a man or a woman can live again if they confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and live in, uh, to bring honor and glory to him. In Ephesians 2, 1, it says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. What Paul is teaching here is that when a man or a woman is born into this world, we're born with a sin nature. If we never do anything to change our, our, our path, our direction, our journey uh, throughout the course of life, and we die in the same state in which we were born, we're going to die and go to hell, and that we will experience the second death. But what Paul is saying here is that uh, when he says he hath quickened, to mean to be quickened is to make alive, all right, to bring to life those that are dead. In other words, if you're an unbeliever, and you come to Jesus Christ and you say, yes, Lord, I want to live for you. I accept the fact that you were crucified on the cross and that after three days you rose again. And if I confess you as Lord and Savior and I uh, keep my faith in you, that I too will know victory over death in the grave. That is the victory that we're talking about. That is the life that we're talking about. And you can have eternal life today. You don't have to wait until the day you die. You can have that eternal life today. The hour is coming and now is. The hour is coming for the physically dead, but now is the time to deal with the spiritually dead. The dead that Jesus is referring to here in the present tense are the spiritually dead in the world, the unbelievers. If an unbeliever will hear the message of Jesus Christ and will uh, submit, humble themselves, confess their sins, and begin to live for, uh, for Jesus, then they can know eternal life. But it is the present, but it is in the present that that answer must be made. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul said, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, to mean to help thee or to bring relief. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The Apostle Paul says that now is the day of salvation. This moment in the present time, don't say to yourself, well, I can put it off in the future somewhere because the future may not come. I got news for you. People are dying every 12 seconds in this world. There are those that say, yeah, well, t tomorrow I'm going to do this or next week I'm going to do that, and tomorrow never comes. 
Next week never comes for them. If you are here today and have never confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, it will be today. Today is going to be the day that you make the decision for eternity. When I give the invitation, it will be in the present that you decide what you're going to do for the future. Let me tell you something. Hell is not full of people that Jesus Christ rejected. Hell is full of people who rejected Jesus Christ. Amen? It's all up to you. What do you decide? What do you do with Jesus? What do you do with that salvation? In Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So when we come and we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we make the public confession and, and we go through baptism and they take and they, uh, they, uh, we, lower, we lower the convert into the water and that is symbolic of the death of Jesus Christ. And then as we bring him up out of the water, that's symbolic of being raised from the grave and uh, from death unto life. The only way you can truly live in this life is with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I know there's people, they think they're doing just fine. They think that they're living a good life. They think that they're having a good time and all those things. But they don't know what life is uh, about. Jesus isn't talking about those who have physically died. They can't hear anything. They can't hear anything. It would be a total waste of my time to drive up here and to the, to the cemetery and to get out into the middle of that cemetery and to begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ at the top of my lungs. For me to cry out to these people to say, hey, repent. Repent and be baptized. For the hour is coming. Well, their hour has already come. There's nobody in those graves that are going to jump up and listen to me or or um, make a a decision that's going to change their course of eternity. Their course of eternity was set the moment they die. The hour is coming when Jesus will speak to those who lie in the graves, and they too shall hear. So we're going to look more at that here in just a minute. In verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. God as creator and giver of life to all things has life in himself and being equal with God the Father Jesus, the the, uh, Son of God has life in himself as well. The life that Jesus provides is eternal. Yes, Jesus can uh, raise uh, raise the dead back to life. He's done it. He could do it. He can do it again. Uh, But here's the thing. What Jesus can do for you is that he can give you eternal life today. I marvel at the amount of Money people spend in an attempt to live forever, physically speaking, of course. Health products, gym memberships, vitamins, and every supplement under the sun is a billion-dollar industry. Men and women dedicate hours and hours of their week in order to, uh, to prepare special meals for dietary products, for uh, going to the gym and all these things. And don't get me wrong, i got no problem with any of that. But it's those that, you know, when I pull up here on Sunday morning, a lot of times I'll see people out here that are jogging and they're riding their bikes and they're doing all that. And the thought that goes through my head is that, you know, the Bible says physical exercise profiteth little. And I said, boy, if they're not going to church here in another hour and a half, you're wasting your time. You might be a pretty corpse, but if you die and go to hell, it's going to be a waste of time. Total waste of time. Verse 27 says, And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Jesus was given the authority to judge mankind, because he came to earth in the flesh as a man, and was tempted in every way as we are, and yet he did not sin. In Hebrews chapter 4 we read this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the uh, feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The question is often asked, could Jesus sin? Could Jesus sin? The Bible tells us that he didn't sin. The Bible tells us that he was the perfect sacrifice, that he was without blemish. But you go back into John chapter 5 and then go down to verse 19, what you're going to read is, is that the Son can do nothing of himself. The Son can do nothing of himself. 
So unless the father uh, approves it, or if the father gives him an example with such, then the answer is no, Jesus could not sin. In his flesh, he experienced the temptations. He experienced the, the hunger and the thirst and the, and the weariness. He experienced frustration. He experienced anger. We remember he drove the money changers out of the temple. Jesus experienced the same things that you and I experience. Oftentimes, I've, I've talked to people when they've gone through a, a horrible tragedy and, or when they lose a loved one, and they'll say, Oh, nobody knows. Nobody knows. I'll say, There's one that knows. Jesus knows. We're never alone in this life. No matter uh, how deep the valley, we're not there by ourselves. Jesus is there with us. When faith with rejection by his family, and friends, Jesus never lashed out at them or cursed them or fought with them. When relentlessly persecuted and harassed by the Jewish leadership, Jesus did not allow his frustration or his weariness to take control and allow himself to sin. Man will often sin when he gets tired of the opposition or trials or tribulations of life. Life can be physically, emotionally, spiritually draining, and there will be times when man will give in to the weariness of those trials and he will sin. Jesus never gave in. I will tell you this, that if you don't stay in your Bible, if you don't stay in a prayer life, if you don't stay in your church attendance, that when you get out in the world and these trials and these tribulations begin to come and they begin to, to gang up on you, to pile up on you, you begin to get tired. You get physically tired. If you get physically tired, you get emotionally tired. You get spiritually tired. And the next thing you know, you're sinning against God because you begin to do things out of frustration. You begin to do things uh, because you think it's a, a shortcut to a fix or to a remedy of the situation. Verse 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Here Jesus begins to address the physical resurrection of those who have died and been buried in the graves or in the tombs. Jesus is plain that sometime in the future there will be a moment when the dead will be summoned to come forth by his voice alone. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Paul wrote about our Lord's coming uh, to gather his bride, the church. There will, however, be two separate and distinct resurrections. I thought about having a slide up there of a cemetery with all these heads in because I've heard it preached that cemeteries are going to look like a plowed field because of all the, well, I don't know if that's the way it's going to work or not. I, could, I can't say. We haven't been there yet, but it's coming. The hour is coming. In verse 29, And shall come forth, talking about the dead, they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Look, <laughs> sometimes I, I snicker at these pompous, arrogant uh, uh, professors or whatever, and I say, well, the Christian belief is so divisive. You better believe it's divisive. You better believe it is. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And I got news for you. I know they say, you know, sheep are supposedly smelly and dumb and all those good things. Well, I'd rather be smelly and dumb and go to heaven than to, than to be the grandest uh, creature in the world and go to hell. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. As long as we live on this earth, we may very well be comfortable in our bodies. I believe that God wants us to enjoy this life. I believe that he wants us, it's a gift from God. That each and every day that we awaken should be filled with joy and we should walk around in peace and we should have the comfort and knowledge that Jesus Christ loves us. But the fact of the matter is, is that as long as we are in our earthly physical bodies, we are physically separated from God. All right? So there's a better day coming. A better day coming. 
When the unbeliever dies, they go to eternal punishment. In Luke's account of the rich man and Lazarus, we read this in the 16th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The Bible says in hell he lift up his eyes when the rich man died. He went to hell, and verse 23 says, being in torments. The word torments refers to tortures. And I want you to note that it's plural. It doesn't say I'm in torment. It says I'm in torments. We know from verse 24 that he suffered physically, saying, being in this flame. We know the rich man could see Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And this, bosom, this phrase, bosom of Abraham, refers to a, a place of future paradise. It's not heaven. It's not the permanent home yet, but it's a representative of where he's headed. So the rich man in hell, he, there's this great abyss, but he can see across the great abyss, and he can see this beggar in Abraham's bosom, and so he's separated from God, and he's separated from God for all eternity. So that's one of the torments that he has to suffer, is that I won't be in the presence of God. You know, we're social critters. We like being around people, generally speaking. And whenever, uh, whenever we're uh, ostracized, whenever we're pushed aside, whenever we're not invited in to be part of a particular group or, or what have you, we begin to feel slighted. We begin to be offended. The rich man is offended beyond any comprehension. Why is that beggar in Abraham's bosom and me being who I am being tormented? He also suffered mental anguish as he begged Abraham to allow Lazarus to go back to earth to warn his brothers about the reality of hell. He said, I've got my brothers. He said, would you let Lazarus go and, and talk to him and tell him about this place? He said, I don't want my brothers to come here. And Abraham said to him in verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, he being the rich man, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they will uh, hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So we know for a fact Jesus Christ, he rose from the dead, and today there's still those that will not believe. So uh, uh, this rich man's argument, it doesn't hold water. So just send him back. He's, he's coming back from the dead. They'll believe one that came back from the dead. Well, they didn't believe the message of Jesus Christ. We were sitting at lunch one day at work, and my boss he was reading this article. They had found one of those, uh, uh, what do you call those little cement coffins over in Europe somewhere. And they, they believed that it was a, uh, the tomb of, uh, or the coffin or whatever, of Peter or somebody. And he said, man, isn't that, isn't that neat? He goes, you know what that's going to do? People, people, maybe they'll believe now. I said, no, they won't. No, they won't. That Jesus came back from the grave. They didn't believe that. So why are they going to believe? Because the cement box was found. But they're not going to believe. People have rejected the message of Jesus Christ, and there was, there was hundreds of witnesses of Jesus being alive after being crucified. The rich man said, he was in torments. I can't imagine anything being worse than going to hell other than being in hell and to realize that because of me, and I'm speaking as a man, I'm speaking as a father, I'm speaking as a leader, that because of me, my family, my wife, my children, my, my uh, uh, grandchildren were going to die and go to hell because of the example that I set, that I would be the cause of that. And so he's saying, please send him. Tell my brothers, you don't want to come here. You don't want to come here. Sometimes I read about some of these great uh, so-called leaders in history that uh, unless there was a miracle on their deathbed, 
they're probably in hell right now. And I thought, boy, if you could just open up the pits of hell and say, hey, what do you think? Would you rather have been a beggar in this life? I bet you the answer would be yes. I bet you they say, yeah, I would have much rather begged my way through life than to, to be the tyrant that I was, even though I was a ruler of many. Over in Revelation chapter 20. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's going to be uh, those that uh, when the day comes, the day of our Lord comes, whenever we stand before him and uh, there were those that they didn't accept the mark of the beast, they didn't uh, sin against God, that they're going to come and there's going to be a resurrection unto life. But in verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. In the future, there will be two resurrections to take place. The first resurrection will be for those who died as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Those who are raised in this resurrection will know eternal life. For the Apostle John wrote in verse 6, On such the second death hath no power. In other words, you won't suffer that spiritual death, that permanent separation from God. You'll be in his presence for all eternity. You'll be raised unto eternal life and avoid the second death, which is eternal punishment and separation. The second resurrection will take place a thousand years after the first resurrection, after the millennial reign of Christ. In Revelation 20, beginning in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You go over into Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 and you read, and there's a whole list of those that are going to join them in, in play. as a child. I've always remembered in that 8th verse, that all liars will have their place in the lake with that burns with fire and brimstone. So uh, that's why you want to get under my skin, call me a liar. And me and you are going to lock heels real quick because that's a serious charge because what you're telling me is that I'm going to hell and I'm not. Uh, that's not my intention and that's certainly not my goal. You want to get under my skin, call me a liar. After we die and are buried in the ground, there are no second chances. There are no mulligans in eternity. There's no hope that you will hear the voice of God in the grave and then you will have a chance to decide. That decision has to be made in the present. That decision has to be made today. That decision has to be made while you still have breath. We know that there are those out there that they believe in purgatory and they believe that you can light a candle and they believe that you can spend money and they believe that you can pray and that you can pray people out of punishment and into heaven. That's not the way it works. It's another lie. I sincerely believe that everyone wants to be part of the first resurrection. I've met a lot of people who I would never have guessed that they were Christian. And we get to talking and eventually I'm going to get around to talking about church and the Lord. And, and they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a believer. Oh, of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, with a mouth like that, you're a Christian? And so usually I follow that up with the first, with a question of, well, where do you go to church? And this one gentleman I was talking to one time, he said, oh, well, I don't go down there with a bunch of hypocrites. And he began to rattle off all the reasons why he didn't want to go to church and organized religion was a horrible thing and all this and all that. And so I just, I just kind of leaned in on his desk and I said, well, why don't you go down there and lead them? And he kind of looked at me like that. I said, no, I'm being serious. You seem to have all the answers. You seem to know what you're doing. 
Why don't you go down there and be the positive influence to get these hypocrites on the right path? Save them from hell. There's people in the world, look, I can't look at anybody's heart. All right, that belongs to God, but I can be a fruit inspector, as they say. The Bible makes it very clear that you will know them by their works. And if their works are, are futile, if their works are, are uh, disruptive, divisive, if their works are uh, to spread uh, anger and violence, and uh, they're not Christians. They're not Christians. And I think we've come to the point in time, I think we've come to the point in history where we as Christians have to be bolder and just stand up and go, I'm a little worried about you. I'm a little worried about you, the things that you say, the things that you do, the way you conduct yourself. One of the biggest things that bothers me today is the fact that we've got so many of our young people that are living together in sin and calling themselves Christian. You go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and it says they're going to hell. They're going to hell. You say, oh no, that's not... Don't believe me. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 and read it for yourself. Adulterers, uh, whoremongers, and fornicators are not fit for the kingdom of God. If he's telling me I'm not fit for his kingdom, then where do I go? I don't read of a third option. There's no Sweden in eternity, all right? There's not a place for those that want to remain neutral. We have to get out of that neutral mode. We have to be able to understand that there's, there's a, a, a saved and there's a lost. So what is meant by the phrase, and death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire? Well, here, death and hell, or are, are Hades, are personified, and their demise is being recorded. Death refers to the first death. In other words, the death of the body, where the body and the soul are separated. So, uh, so once we get into eternity, that, that process will never take place again. So death, the first death, ceases to occur At the second resurrection, the soul and body will be reunited. And this new resurrected body will be configured for eternity uh, in a manner that it will be able to suffer the torments that the rich man spoke of, and it will not be consumed. You can take this body now, and you can go toss it in a fire, and it'll be consumed. But you do it in eternity, that eternal body that, that God will give us or give the unbelievers of the world then that body will not be consumed. It'll be able to be tormented for all eternity. Hell or Hades here refers to a temporary place of torment. Those unbelievers who have died throughout history go to hell to suffer punishment until they appear at the great white throne of judgment and their names not being found in the book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire and this will be their eternal place of punishment. So this, this punishment that they're receiving right now it's a holding place until they stand before God and at the great white throne judgment, and then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. So Hades, this temporary punishment, place of punishment, will go away, and then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is, as he spoke to those unbelieving Jews that had gathered around over 2,000 years ago. Today, though, his word is still telling you, the unbeliever, the hour is coming and now is. In the present, in the present, we have an opportunity to come to Christ and be saved. One of these days, I just haven't had the, the nerve. Over in Isaiah, it talks about us putting off, putting off the, the, the bad day. And I thought, you know what, one of these days I'm going to come up here and I'm going to have me a German chocolate cake on this table with a knife and a fork and a plate and all that. And then over there I'm going to have scales. And I'm going to say, yeah, we like to put off the day that we have to be weighed in because that cake is too good. I can sit down and eat that whole German chocolate cake. But Sunday you're going to have to go over and walk over and stand up on that scale. That's one of the things I hate going to doctors. Hate it. First thing they want to do is embarrass you. Go ahead and jump up on the scale. Look, I haven't jumped up on anything in a long time, okay? <laughs> so, so that just isn't going to work for me. So, and then I just sit there and watch those numbers click off. And it's like, really? <laughs> Can't you slow that thing down a little bit? In the present, we have the opportunity to be born again. 
unchanged, that is, having never confessed Christ, we will in the future be judged. Either in the first judgment where we receive reward as followers of Jesus Christ or in the second resurrection when you receive eternal punishment. The Bible says that in that second resurrection that there's going to be a book opened. He's going to open the book of life. And he's going to begin to, you know, he's he's already going to know your name. And you're not there for anything good. We already know the answer. So I find it interesting uh, that, that he's going to look through that book. And when your name's not found, then he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. How do you get your name in that book of life? By accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. By saying, Lord, that I confess my sins and please forgive me of those sins and help me to live for you. Every week we put a a prayer of repentance, repentance up on the screen. If you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior, take time to read through that. But more importantly, take time, come down and kneel. Let me walk you through the Romans road. Let's get right with Jesus because the hour is coming. As we stand, Brother George is going to sing a verse or two.